So, so my training is as a developmental psychologist, and for the last decade or so, I've been looking at what it means developmentally for kids to be growing up in an information or, or digital age. And then recently, along with my colleague and former, former doctoral student who's here tonight, today, Dr. Danielle Law, um, we've begun to explore the issue of cyberbullying. So I hate to you know, talk about something negative as such a positive conference, but here we go. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, um, give, you, give you a little bit of a primer on what we know about it and more about what we don't know, because it's very new field. We don't know that much. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things I think we can do to help. Okay. So, oh, there we go. Cyberbullying is it's generally defined as using a technological device to bully a person by sending or posting hurtful messages or images online. Um, these are just some clippings from across North America and around the world, that many of which you'll recognize. Um, so it's, it's definitely a well-known ph phenomenon. Uh, and I think, although the media has raised awareness about this issue, which I think is good because it is a concerning issue, I think it's raised, the for parents and educators, I think it's raised the levels of fear about our kids' safety online, <clears throat> excuse me, to really unrealistic levels. And then I think the, a little bit the opposite has happened for kids. So I think for kids, cyberbullying has become this kind of extreme and very serious thing that happens and you see in the media, but it, which leads them to kind of discount the day-to-day -day kind of incidences that may be happening around them. So one of the goals today hopefully will be to address some of these miscon misconceptions. Okay, so, and to start that, I'm just going to kind of talk about how cyberbullying compares with, with more traditional forms of bullying. So researchers originally thought that cyberbullying was just an, it was the same as bullying, that it was just an extension maybe of social bullying that happened to be occurring in an online venue. But now we really do recognize it, that they are quite unique due to the structural and functional nature of the digital world. They really are unique forms of aggression. Um, so I thought it'd be good to kind of unpack that a little bit for us. So for bullying to be probably most of you know, but for bullying to, an aggressive act to truly be defined as bullying, there needs to be three criteria that are met. So there needs to be an intent to harm, it needs to be repeated over time, and there needs to be a power differential between the, the victim and the perpetrator. And in a virtual environment, all of these things are kind of either look very different or actually are irrelevant because, as I said, it's, it's a different kind of way of communicating. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about each of those characteristics to highlight this. Um, so regarding the intent to harm, um, so I have research that shows that what kids think mostly is happening online is just joking or kidding around. That, that actually very little, little of it, like almost none, is truly intended to harm. And unfortunately, we know that the experience for the victim is, can be very devastating and it can be very harmful. So there's this kind of disconnect between they might not be intending it, but the victim is still experiencing it. Um, and in fact, some work is starting to show that being victimized in an online capacity can be actually more emotionally damaging than being victimized in a schoolyard or face-to-face -face setting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, regarding repetition, some of the most horrific cases of cyberbullying were based on a single event that happened. Um, the victims, of course, still experienced the event over and over again, but it's actually the virtual bystanders who are responsible for the repetition by reposting and recirculating the event online. So repetition really looks different online. And then finally, regarding power, for traditional forms of bullying, the power usually resides with the physically stronger or more socially competent individual. Um, but in a virtual, in, oops, sorry, uh, in a virtual environment, that same power differential doesn't exist. So it used to be thought that the person who had the technological know-how, who had, you know, had, was better with better tech skills, they're the ones that held the power. But now we know as user interfaces become that much more user friendly, it's really an even playing field online. And in fact, this of course serves to make it retaliation much easier online. And we are seeing that retaliation is happening more, on, more and more online. So some research is emerging that kids will be often, if they're bullied in a face-to-face -face or at school, they'll come home and use the internet as a way to re retaliate. So we're seeing evidence of that. 
Now, I do want to add a caveat that I'm not suggesting that um, there's no overlap between cyberbullying and bullying. So absolutely there are cases of cyberbullying that fit these cr three criteria or that are start as face-to-face -face bullying and then extend, as I said, online. But my concern is that if we ignore the unique aspects of cyber, of cyber aggression, then current prevention and intervention programs probably won't be that effective. So for example, if we have kids who don't even recognize that they're engaging in aggressive and hostile acts, no anti-bullying program is gonna work with those kids. Okay, so what do we know about cyberbullying? It is a, um, it's a very new field. Research is on its infancy. The first published study was in 2004, and, but I think 90% of the studies have probably happened in the last three to four years. Um, on top of that, technology is constantly changing. So what constitutes cyberbullying at one point changes over time for, and across studies. But there is some consistency emerging. So. Prevalence rates across studies tend to fall within the range of 30 to 50 percent of kids reporting that they're in engaging in cyberbullying or cyber victimization. That's a lot of kids. Um, we know that it increases regarding age. It increases between the ages of 10 to 13. But we also know that we're giving kids younger and younger kids access to the internet. So my hunch is that over time, that will also shift downward. And then finally, we re really know that we've also know that. More, excuse me, more marginalized groups such as LGBTQ youth and youth from ethnic minorities are more likely to report being cyberbullied. Um, and of course, we know quite a bit about the impact of cyberbullying. It's not good. Um, so it's associated with a whole host of negative outcomes, including self lowered self-esteem, depression, anxiety, social isolation, substance abuse, suicide ideation, and then of course all what we've seen in the media, even in some cases suicide. Um, so victimization, as I mentioned earlier, is, can be worse for cyberbullying than for traditional forms of bullying, and that's for two reasons. First, the permanency of data. So imagine if you're in a schoolyard fight, you, you know, it would be an awful experience having that fight, but the memory of it would fade over time. But if, in contrast, if, you ha if something happens to you online, that photo or that conversation or that video, whatever the event was, will never degrade over time. Digital information is permanent. And so every time you come across it, you see it, it comes in your Facebook feed or whatever, you're going to relive it in its most original, in its original most potent form. And then regarding the constant presence, of course, going back to the fight, you could have the fight in the schoolyard, but then you'd go home and be safe with your family. But now, of course, with mobile devices, the event will come in the house with you and even into the bedroom. Um, so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and now. Talk about a little bit about parenting, where I think we kind of need to, uh, uh, parenting and technology. Some of the research we've done on that, and some of my thoughts on that. Um, so here's a Google a shot a Google screen. A Google search, a screen, screenshot of a Google search of the words internet and parenting. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, how clear it is, but all of the top hits, so this is just a couple of days ago, and all of the top hits are about safety and protection. So it's really not hard to see why parents have so much fear when we realize that the main message they get from, from their sources of information is that the internet is a really scary and dangerous place for kids. Um, and so unfortunately, what they do with this fear is they really want to limit and control and monitor what their kids are doing online. They want to be those, those limiters that, that Alexander was talking about earlier. Um, and I think this, this tends to work for children and, and, and even preteens. You know, I, I, I'd like to think I'm a mentor. I am in lots of ways, but I also do know that I have fairly limited I let my I, I limit my kids access to the internet. So my eight year old he he knows I'm the master of the internet in the house and and my eleven year old a little bit less and my husband because you know I study this stuff so it's the one area I get to pull rank. So yeah I'm <laughs> I'm master internet. <laughs> but now after Alexandra's talk I want to be mentor internet internet mentorer. So um, so as a, so. Anyway, as the kids get older, it becomes more and more difficult. And as I said, I'm already starting to see that with my 11-year-old. And, and I don't really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a fairly mentoring approach, but I do have some time constraints that I put on. Um, but not only does it become harder for them because 
they, we, we can't be there watching what they're doing online all the time. But it actually, in fact, may be unhealthy for their overall development. And so what I mean by that is that we kind of know that um, for healthy adolescent development, they need to meet certain milestones. They need to become autonomous from their parents. They need to be able to make decisions for themselves, and they need to be able to take responsibility for the actions. So to be fully functioning adults, these are the things that they need to practice at and become good at during adolescence. And if a parent's overly controlling or micromanaging them, they'll have no opportunity to do this. So two parenting researchers, Statine and Kerr, um, they looked at parental knowledge to kind of, the work that they did with this really supports this idea. So what they did, they looked at three sources of parental no- parent knowledge. Um, so you know, the first one is child disclosure, spontaneous child disclosure. So you know what your kids are up to because you have a really open and caring two-way relationship with your child such that they feel comfortable telling you what's going on in their life, the good and the bad. Um, the other child Sorry, I just noticed the time. <laughs> I just had the same. No, I know I just had the same reaction as Rob was describing. <laughs> amygdala, amygdala. <laughs> I'm, uh, so, they, so the other source they looked at was um, monitoring. So you know what your kids are doing because you have very tight limits and controls and know where they are at any given moment of the day. And then finally, you know what your kids are doing because you're constantly demanding them. Where are you going? Who are you going to be with? What are you going to do when you get there? That doesn't sound familiar to me at all. (laughs) Um, So once we've we've connected with kids and we've built relationships, I think then we can navigate the technology. (laughs) Then we can start talking, bringing in conversations about technology. So I think we really need to highlight the importance to teens about being socially responsible online. I think, you know, have conversations that help them understand that it's a person at the other end of the message, whether it's said face-to-face or via technology is still a person receiving it. Um, And then I think we need to help them see through the technology so that they can develop empathy and compassion for that invisible person on the other end of the message. Um, As part of this, I think we need to talk about the challenges associated with online communication. So as was discussed, it's there's a lot of, you know, 80% of communication is nonverbal, and yes, we have emoticons, and I like that that research is, you know, that Shelley was talking about how that, you know, we, that can um, compensate for some of the nonverbal, but I don't believe that it can completely compensate. You know, just the fact that there were three, three choices for each emoticon plus all the ones we came up with in our own heads, I think it's, it's, uh, it helps, and so do writing in all caps. We all know what that means, <laughs> but... But I think we still are, there's still challenges that are come, come with that. So I think as parents and educators, we can share our own experiences of sending that email to our boss that maybe didn't go over so well or was misperceived or receive, or misinterpreting the email that wasn't intended in the way we read. So I think that those are the kinds of conversations we, need to, we can have with kids to help them. Um, and I think that's the last thing I'm going to talk about right now. Um, but I encourage you tomorrow, I'm... We're in one of the breakout sessions. I have lots more to say about this kind of thing. So thank you very much.